Welcome to our deep dive. Um, today, you've brought us some really cool research on active disturbance rejection control. ADRC for sure. ADRC, okay, yeah. Yeah. And this paper we're looking at is called uh, On the Notions of Normality, Locality, and Operational Stability in ADRC. That's the one. And it really dives into like why this control approach works so well. Yeah, it's super interesting. And, and get this, it, it might just change how we think about good old PID control. It really might, yeah. It's, it's a fascinating approach. Okay. The, the core idea is that no matter how complex the system is, yeah. You can you can treat its dynamics like a simple chain of integrators. Wow. Okay. With disturbances acting on them. So it's like you just simplify everything down. Simplify down. To this like basic chain of integrators. I, I guess that seems kind of wild to me. It does. It does. Why would you want to simplify things to that extent? It seems like you'd be losing a ton of information about how the system actually works. Right. And and that's exactly where the concepts of normality and locality come in. And, and this is what the paper really digs into. Okay. It turns out that by focusing on a specific frequency range, yeah. we can actually make this simplification work incredibly well. Okay. I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Let's, let's unpack this a little bit. The paper starts with an example of a system with some uncertain parameters, right. which is something you'd encounter all the time in the real world, right? All the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And, and they apply... Uh, what's called a second order LADRC to this system. Okay. Essentially, it uses an extended state observer, okay, or ES, to figure out what's messing with the system's behavior, uh -huh. and then a controller to counteract those disturbances. Okay, so the ESO is like the detective. Exactly. It's like looking at everything. It is. Seeing what's going wrong. Constantly monitoring, yeah. And the controller then is the one that steps in and like... Fixes it. Fixes the problem. That's right. Keeps things on track. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And now... Here's the kicker. Even with all this uncertainty in the system's parameters, uh -huh. the LEDRC keeps it remarkably stable. Wow. Okay. And this is where the ideas of normality and locality start to shine. Okay, so walk me through this normality concept. Uh, what does that even mean in this context? So think of it this way. Okay. ADRC takes all sorts of systems, even really complicated ones. Yeah. And it, it normalizes them. Uh -huh by modeling their behavior around a specific frequency okay. as, a, as a simple chain of integrators. Oh, wow. So you're telling me that like all these different systems, no matter how complicated they are, uh -huh. we can view them through this lens of like the simple integrator chain yeah. and that that's what gives us like a powerful tool for controlling them. Exactly. That's that's pretty neat. It is. It is. And, and the paper gives some really great examples. Okay. Systems that are stable. Systems that are unstable, even systems with time delays. Oh, wow. They can all be represented locally as this double integrator. Mm. It's surprisingly powerful. That's where I'm starting to get the aha moment. Like, Go. I see how this could be useful. Yeah. Yeah. But what about locality? Okay. How does that fit into all this? So locality is all about focusing on the most relevant information. Okay. So an ADRC... The controller design uh -huh. mainly relies on what's happening near the chosen frequency. Okay. And that's often called a crossover frequency. So so this idea of focusing on a specific frequency range, right. or what the paper calls locality, right. seems crucial here. It is. Why, why is that so important? It's important because it lets us ignore the less relevant parts of the system's behavior. Okay. So, so remember that example where the system parameters were uncertain? Yeah, yeah. Locality explains why ADRC could handle those changes. Uh -huh. It's because it's focusing on that narrow frequency band okay. where the system is well behaved, mm -hmm. even if things are changing drastically outside that range. So it's like we're we're like tuning out the noise right. and focusing on just the signal we need. That's a great way to put it. To keep the system like under control. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And, and this is actually related to a concept that TSDN termed operational stability. Oh. And it's the ability to deal with unforeseen changes in the system. Hmm. The paper even shows an example where a system suddenly loses an integrator. Wow. A pretty dramatic change. Yeah. And yet the ADRC controller barely flinches. That's that's really impressive. It is. It is. I'm starting to see why ADRC is getting so much attention. Yeah. But before we move on, I'm, I'm curious. What's the connection to PID control that you mentioned earlier? Right. It seems like a world apart from all this talk of integrators and operational stability. Right. Well, that's where things get really interesting. Okay. The paper shows that PID control uh -huh. can actually be seen as a simplified version. Really? Of this second order LEDRC. 
Whoa, so you're saying PID has been doing this all along? Kind of, yeah. Without us realizing it. Yeah, we just That's thought. a fascinating new perspective. It is. Yeah. It is. It's like we've been using this incredibly powerful tool for decades, mm -hmm. but without fully understanding like the theory behind it. That's right. Yep. And that's what this paper is all about. Yeah. Shedding light on the underlying principles of ADRC mm -hmm. and <laughs> showing how they connect to something as familiar as PID control. This is blowing my mind a little bit. It is pretty cool. We've gone from thinking about ADRC as this complex, right. almost like esoteric approach yeah. to seeing its roots in something as ubiquitous as PID. It is. And, and this connection isn't just a theoretical curiosity. Okay. It has real practical implications for how we design and tune controllers. Okay. The paper outlines a three-step design process. Oh, cool. That can be applied to both ADRC and PID control. Okay, I'm definitely hooked. Yeah. Tell me more about this design framework. All right, so the first step yeah. is to establish what the paper calls a local nominal model for the system at our desired frequency. Okay. And this model is usually a chain of integrators because it's simple. Yeah. And as we've seen, many real-world systems can be approximated this way near a specific frequency. Right. It's all about finding that sweet spot. Exactly. Where the system behaves nicely, yeah. even if things are messy elsewhere. Right. Okay, so what's the next step? So the second step is to choose the appropriate controller based on this local nominal model. Okay, so if we have a model with two integrators, right. we'd use a second order LADRC uh -huh. or even a PID. Right. Exactly. Okay. We match the controller complexity to yeah, the model gotcha. and then the final step is to tune the controller parameters yeah to get the performance we want okay usually around that chosen frequency so we're essentially like shaping the system's response yeah almost like an artist molds clay exactly to create a masterpiece that's a great analogy it sounds like this framework gives us a really clear roadmap it does for designing controllers I whether don't... we're using adrc or pid that's right it's awesome okay and to show how practical this framework is, yeah. the paper gives an example where a second-order LADRC is designed for a system with a time delay. Okay. Which is notoriously tricky to control. Time delays are always a pain. They are. They are. Yeah. And the results are impressive. Okay. They hit their target performance beautifully. That's great to hear. It is. It's always exciting to see theory translate into real-world results. It certainly is. But, you know, this whole discussion has raised a really intriguing question for me. Okay. What if we encounter a system that's so complex yeah. that we can't even find a suitable local nominal model? Right. What if it's like the behavior is constantly changing and evolving? Yeah. It seems like we've been talking about relatively well-behaved systems. We have, we have. But there's a whole world out there that's far more challenging. Absolutely, and those are fantastic questions. Yeah. That's where things get really exciting for future research. Okay. And we'll explore those ideas more in just a bit. Awesome, can't wait. Welcome back. <laughs> so before we went to uh, the little break there, we were talking about how this paper shows that PID control can be seen as like a simplified version of this second order LADRC. Yeah, it's like finding out your favorite everyday tool has this hidden, sophisticated backstory. Totally. We've been using PID for ages. Yeah. But this paper reveals a deeper connection to these ideas of normality and locality. I'm still wrapping my head around that. It's pretty wild. How how did they actually derive PID from LADRC in the paper? Like, did they sprinkle some magic mathematical dust and poof, PID appears? Not quite magic, but pretty clever math. Okay. Uh, so remember that LADRC uses an equation with a specific parameter. Right, the bandwidth of the ESO. Exactly. That determines how quickly the ESO reacts to disturbances. Right, right. Now, if you make some approximations in that equation, okay. specifically ignoring terms that become less important at lower frequencies. So sort of like decluttering a formula. Yes. Tossing out the bits that don't have much impact. Exactly. When you do that, the LADRC equation simplifies into something that looks remarkably like, you guessed it, the PID controller structure. No way. So by making those approximations, we essentially strip away some of the higher frequency capabilities of LADRC. That's right. But what's left is like the core essence of PID. That's a great way to think about it. It's like LADRC is this powerful multi-tool. Okay. And PID is a trusty screwdriver perfect for many tasks. I like it, yeah. And what's even cooler is that this connection like reframes how we understand PID. 
It does. It's not just this empirical method that's been around forever. Right. It has like a theoretical foundation in these concepts of normality and locality. Absolutely. It's like uncovering the secret origin story of a superhero. I love that. And and this new understanding opens up all sorts of interesting possibilities. Like what? Well, for example, imagine you're working on a system where PID is a good fit. Okay. You could use this LADRC-inspired framework to design and tune the PID controller more effectively. So instead of blindly tweaking those PID parameters, it's... we could leverage the principles of normality and locality uh -huh. to make smarter design decisions. Precisely. We could analyze the system's behavior near our desired crossover frequency. Okay. And choose PID parameters more systematically, potentially getting better performance and robustness compared to traditional PID tuning methods. Oh, that's awesome. It is. So I'm really starting to see the value of this framework, but it sounds like it's not limited to just the LADRC and PID, right? You're absolutely right. The paper emphasizes that this framework can be applied more broadly. Oh, okay. It's really about adopting a new way of thinking about control design. Yeah. Based on these core concepts of normality and locality. Okay, I'm sold. Yeah. Let's break down the steps of this design framework one more time just to make sure I've got it. All right, so the first step is establishing that local nominal model for the system at the desired frequency. Right, finding that sweet spot where the system behaves nicely. Exactly. Then what? The second step is selecting a suitable controller based on this local nominal model. And, and this is where things get interesting. We're not restricted to just LA, DRC, or PID. Oh, cool. We can choose from a whole family of controllers. Wow. Depending on how many integrators are in our model. So if our model have, say, three integrators, mm -hmm. we could use a third order LEDRC. Yes. Or even a PID with an extra derivative term like PIDD2. Precisely. The key is to match the complexity of the controller yeah. to the complexity of the local nominal model. Got it. Then the final step is tuning the controller. Exactly. The specifics of tuning depend on which control you choose. Uh huh. But the overall goal is to achieve the desired performance around that chosen frequency. Okay, it's like we're shaping the system's response. Ah. Just like an artist molds clay to create a masterpiece. That's right. This framework really does provide a clear roadmap for designing controllers. It does. From choosing the model to fine tuning the parameters. It's an elegant and powerful approach. Totally, yeah. Instead of struggling against the system's complexity, we embrace it and use it to our advantage. Exactly. The paper has this really cool example where they design a second order LADRC for a system with a time delay, right. which, as we know, can be a real pain. They can be. Yeah. Time delays are notorious for messing with control systems. For sure. So that's a great testament to the practicality of this framework. Yeah. It's not just a theoretical concept. Right. It actually works in challenging situations. That's what gets me excited, seeing theory translate into tangible results. It is. But, you know, this whole discussion has raised a really intriguing question for me. Okay. What if we encounter a system that's so complex that we can't even find a suitable local nominal model? Uh, now you're getting to the heart of what makes this field so fascinating. Okay. We'll delve into those challenges and the potential solutions after a quick break. I can't wait. Welcome back. So before the break, we were pondering this big question, you know, what happens when we encounter systems that are so complex or unpredictable that we can't even find a simple model for them? It seems like we hit the limits of this elegant framework we've been talking about. Yeah, that's a challenge that researchers are grappling with right now. It's like we've been exploring this well-mapped territory mm -hmm. and now we're venturing into uncharted lands. I like that analogy. Yeah. So how do we even begin to navigate this uncharted territory? Where do we go from here? One path is to explore more sophisticated models. Okay. They can capture the behavior of these complex systems. Yeah. So instead of relying solely on those simple integrator chains, uh -huh. we might need models that account for things like nonlinearities, time delays, right. and even changing dynamics. So, so we need to like upgrade our toolkit. We do. Find new ways to represent the richness and complexity of these systems. Exactly. And maybe those models won't be fixed. Okay. Maybe they need to adapt and learn as the system changes over time. Oh, wow, okay. We could even incorporate machine learning techniques. Oh, that's interesting. To build models that can evolve alongside the system they're describing. That's a fascinating idea, like models that constantly learn and refine themselves. Yeah. Becoming more accurate and insightful over time. That's right. It's like giving our controllers a brain that can adapt to new challenges. Exactly. It's about moving from static models to dynamic ones. Yeah. From controllers that simply react to ones that can anticipate and learn. That's where things get really interesting. That's where it gets fun. 
it sounds like this is pushing the boundaries of control theory. It is. Venturing into a realm where control systems become almost intelligent. Almost intelligent, yeah. yeah. And, and it's not just about developing new models. Okay. We might need to rethink how we design and tune controllers right. for these complex systems yeah. instead of fixed parameters. Yeah. We might need to explore adaptive control techniques okay. that can adjust those parameters on the fly. Gotcha. Responding to changes in the system's behavior. So it's not just about building smarter models. It's also about creating smarter controllers that can leverage those models effectively. Absolutely. It's a co-evolution. Okay. Better models lead to better controllers, and better controllers demand more sophisticated models. This whole conversation has been such a journey. It has. Starting with this paper's insights into ADRC uh -huh. and ending up on, like, the edge of what's possible in control theory. Yeah, it's been fun. I'm walking away with a newfound appreciation for both, like, the elegance of these core concepts, right. but also the sheer excitement of the challenges that lie ahead. Yeah, there's still so much to explore. It really is. It's pretty amazing. And to you, our listener, we hope this deep dive has sparked your curiosity and given you a new perspective on how we can tame even the most unruly systems. That's right. Who knows, maybe your questions and insights will be the key to unlocking the next breakthrough in control theory. Keep exploring, keep questioning, yeah. keep pushing the boundaries of what's possible. That's what it's all about. The future of control is waiting to be written, and you might just be the one to write it. I love it. Well, thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Thanks for having me. Until next time, keep learning, keep innovating. And keep diving deep. Keep diving deep.